Imagine that you are a bright and curious person who just spent the last four years learning about a topic that you really, really loved. Your next logical step might be to go to grad school and get a PhD in that. So you take your classes and you take advantage that there's no real pressure on you to be producing research in these first two years and there's a certain amount of freedom to come up with a question to answer with your PhD that you find personally interesting. You go along with the flow thinking that doing experiments or doing research is just checking experiments off a checklist and not digging deeper or having your own motivation for the work that you're doing. Eventually, this lack of direction and control over your work will lead you to feel some sort of burnout and maybe just a lack of overall purpose for why you're in grad school in the first place or motivation for continuing the research. Lack of ownership over your own project and lack of progress in your research will lead your advisor to tell you that maybe it's just best for both of you if you give up the PhD and move on to whatever the next step of your career is. Hello physics family, welcome back to another video in my vlog series. If you're new here, my name is Corinne and I do physics. I post videos in, well, I'm posting videos in this vlog series documenting me finishing up my PhD in the next like three to four months and just the lessons that I've learned along the way in the last seven years of working towards this goal. In today's video, it's gonna be a little bit of a background and a little bit of a story time that I've already queued up with that introduction. It's gonna be how and why I got put on academic probation. I don't really know any other grad students who have been put on academic probation. So while the story that I posed in the very beginning is simplified, it is essentially the summary of my first five years in grad school, unfortunately. So I was able to turn things around for myself, obviously, because I'm making this series to begin with but I wanna talk a little bit about the major mistakes that I made that led me to that point in the first place before I talk about what things I had to do to turn things around. So my number one biggest mistake, like I didn't fully know what the physics research was going to entail, and I truly didn't know myself well enough to know that physics probably wasn't the field that I should have gone into. And that is something that has taken me a long time to accept and just kind of come to peace with, uh, I'll talk a little bit later. I guess technically I do regret it. I wish that I had known myself better at the time to pick a field that I was really passionate about because PhD, the level of commitment, the level of persistence and patience that you need to actually take something from an inkling of an idea or something that you think is cool and producing an entire body of work around that, like seven years worth of work around that, there are going to be obstacles along the way and like not, there's always going to be issues when trying to do something of this magnitude, but if you are so passionate and really just have like that internal driving force behind why you want to study what you study and the driving your questions, I feel like it makes it a little bit easier to muster up the strength necessary to push through some of those obstacles. Um, and I just... I loved physics. I still like love the lens that it gives you to look through the world. So like that's always something that I really appreciated. But it took me until being so many years in, you know, never feeling truly fully passionate about the work to the point that like I wanted to take on questions myself. So that was like kind of the theme that was going through that little montage too that kept coming up over and over again is I never had that passion or desire to take ownership over my own project basically until I was forced to. And that was ended up being like a huge key component. So I just got done having some people stay with me. So I need to rearrange my furniture and re put together my uh, working space because they were using that room um, to set up their air mattress and stuff. So I'm gonna take a break and do that. And then we'll come back and get into what exactly I had to do to get my PhD turned around in the right direction. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. So now that my office is roughly back together, 
we're gonna continue on with our story of how I was able to turn things around. Part of the process of turning it around was first to have some really open conversations with my boss and some of that happened before he told me that it might be best if we move on. So February 2020, I was feeling in that place where I was super fed up with a degree. I wasn't passionate about doing the research that I was doing. I hadn't found my point of view or my perspective on my research, so there was no ownership to it whatsoever. I just felt like I was following along with some plan that I didn't really understand. At that point, I didn't feel like even if I finished the PhD that it would give me the skills that I needed to then move on to whatever I wanted to do after the PhD. I will say I no longer feel that's the case two years later. I think there are tons of transferable skills um, that I especially honed that are super, super useful and I'm happy that I stayed. But I was originally planning on leaving since so February 2022, um, right before the pandemic started and lockdown started and all of that. My advisor was kind of of the same opinion. He had been writing me for years, kind of putting pressure on me that he wasn't seeing the motivation that he had hoped to see from me in research. And I do think that was a fair assessment. Um, I don't have any hard feelings against him. I, I do think that there are probably certain things that he could have handled better. But honestly, uh, I've heard plenty of people talk about their advisors and there's always gonna be something your advisor's lacking in. The quicker you can become aware of that and try and address it, obviously the better. It took me to a pretty extreme point to kind of understand where my advisor and I weren't seeing eye to eye and weren't working well together. So then I went around and like told my entire committee that I was leaving, then the pandemic hit and one of my committee members, the one who was like, are you sure there's no way that you can stay? Are you sure that there's no way for you to take what you did and turn it into something that you could push a thesis out? Like people, put, like you put in five years in this basically, don't waste your investment if you can help it. So she was the one who convinced me to change my mind and to stay and kind of helped me put together at least an outline. I went back to my advisor, told him that I changed my mind, especially given the current global situation. He had seemed on board, but then when we met two weeks later, he gave me the spiel of basically like, I think it would be better for everyone if we just moved on. So this was probably around like April or May now of 2020. And I had to go over my advisor's head to the graduate student director, explain to them what was going on, plead my case for why I think I should stay. I'm pretty sure that committee member who did convince me to stay had to go to bat for me and put her reputation probably on the line to say that I deserve another chance. And the compromise that my advisor made with the grad student director is that I would be put on academic probation. So the summer of my fifth year, I was put on academic probation and my terms to get off of probation were that I needed to write two reports. So one was a research review of everything that I had done up for those past five years, basically up until that point. And then the second report was a research proposal, which was essentially my proposal for what was gonna go into my thesis, proof that I had done all the like, I had to do a literature review as part of that, I had to explain my methods as part of that, and I had to produce basically a rough timeline to prove that I could do it in the time that I had left. I think at that point I had three years. So technically my official deadline of when I need to get my PhD by before they can kick me out is next August. So I would have had three years to complete everything at the point that I was doing, writing these reports. So I wrote the reports, they each ended up being about 30 pages each. Then I presented the summary of those two reports to my committee for them to approve. Yes, we think that you can do this. And they agreed. And then the past two, years or so I've essentially just been the uh, things have changed but we I've improved communication with my advisor I've improved my level of ownership over my project and just kind of slowly worked through that research proposal but always again kept that this is going to be my story of my data and these are the questions that I am putting forward to ask nobody else has any responsibility to answer them except for me and yeah, that is pretty much my academic probation story. Uh, I do like to tell this story a lot, mostly because I've never met another grad student who's been put on academic probation. I don't even really know of anyone from my undergrad who is on academic probation, so I like to shock people with it, but also let them know 
that if you're going towards kind of a bad direction in grad school, there is one, I want to normalize it. I think that it's okay that even with Hello Howitzer, all the passion in the world, you can still feel lost at points throughout your PhD and feel like you've lost your purpose a little bit for what you're studying. I think that that's completely normal. Um, so I do want to normalize that. I do like to shock people because I'm dramatic. <laughs> yes, hello. You don't want to be on the camera. We've got a little, a little howitzer baby with us. Um, I also think that it's like, it's okay if you don't have all the undying passion in the world, because I don't, uh, I think if that is your situation, uh, like that's okay, especially if you're not surrounded by people who feel the same way as you, like again, I just want to like normalize that things are hard through grad school, so it's okay if you don't have all the passion in the world for your research. The two things I would say to ask yourself that are, can you make it interesting enough and can you make it worth your while that you should, that like it would be worth it to finish? If you could answer both of those questions for yourself, then I would try and work on taking some steps, uh, maybe similar steps to me. Maybe you are a little bit further back in your process where you can still switch advisors or switch groups. Like that's always, I know people who have switched groups halfway through. Um, that wasn't an option for me. I highly recommend taking ownership over your project as early as you can. Um, that isn't always something that you can do like right as soon as you get into grad school, but if you're kind of knowing that that's the direction you should be going and that you want to be able to take ownership as early as possible, then hopefully that can help you kind of narrow in your focus and not be like dicking around a little bit like I was. Um, and then also if there isn't some sort of research proposal or candidacy seminar that's already built into your program, definitely take the time to do those exercises for yourself because they were invaluable to me to, to do those exercises and to constantly be checking in, like even on like a yearly basis to make sure, well, okay, is this even still my research plan? And those, and especially like the outlines for those can lead into and then be your kicking off, your jumping off point for your thesis and make things hopefully a little bit easier for you down the road if you already have an idea of what story you're telling and what work needs to be done. Um, so yeah, with all that being said, and since I do want these videos to be keeping you up to date with my work as well, I have two experiments that I analyzed the raw data for yesterday and now today I'm going to use that analyzed data to create some the visuals for it that are going to go in my thesis. So I'm going to go ahead and work on that and once I have those pictures done I will show you them. But just to also show, I do a lot of stuff on the computer but I also do a lot of note, note taking and working out things on paper. Also I have a whiteboard, like I need a lot of space. I think if anything about my work styles, I need a lot of space to spread out and like take the all the madness that's going on up here and just like put it somewhere. So that's why I have the big monitors, I have the other big desk behind me, and I have all different sorts of paper to write on and ways to write things if I feel so inclined to do that. But yeah, but even like, so I said I analyzed the data yesterday, I knew I was going to be focusing on plotting and visualizing today, and it's not like I've never plotted this stuff before, so I have like some questions listed out of sticking points and like just details that I need to make decisions on for colors, for how I want things organized, I'll even like do a sketch of like each of these is going to be test subjects, and then on each of these squares there will be multiple lines of different colors that represent different things. So. I usually do some sort of pre-planning before just jumping into the code so that I have an idea of like what I need my data to say because oh, at the end of the day these pictures are going to be supporting my argument um, visually so they should look a certain way so that you can like immediately get what the, what is the point? Always be asking yourself what is the point? But more on that in the next video. Um, let me go ahead and do this work. I'll show you the pretty pictures that I get when I'm done, and then we'll do an outro with the husky who is down here, and yeah. Hello. It is like a week later since I filmed this entire video. I still haven't got all my figures done, um, just because some stuff has come up that I've needed to deal with. 
but I got one figure done and I got the rest of the video edited today. So I wanted to go ahead and at least show you the one figure that I did. Okay. I think that this is all going to work. So this is from my most recent experiment that I did. So the, each of these three panels and it's actually, so I know I showed my notes, like when I, in the last clip of like how I was going to organize things. That's not, I haven't finished everything, but so this is like half of those bottom squares that I had drawn on that piece of paper. So each of these different panels, three different panels are three different test subjects who perform this experiment. Um, and then each of the lines on each of those panels is a different contrast that the experiment was done at. And the experiment overall was that the motion of the stimulus, so your test subject, you're sitting, you're looking at the computer, you get a stimulus, it has a 50-50 chance of going up or down, and you can only, and your the thing that's being varied is the amount of time that you see the stimulus for, as short as like, what was the shortest one that I tested? Like 16 milliseconds. So like, what's on this x-axis is milliseconds, of how long the stimulus was on the screen that you got a chance to look at it for before you had to decide, oh, I think it's moving up or I think it's moving down. And then on the y-axis here is what your proportion correct was given for a certain number of trials where you were given like that same exposure time over and over and over again. So, um, and then I did that for different, for like a super high contrast, a medium contrast, and a very low contrast for each person. What is considered low, medium, and high, uh, I pulled from previous data and experiments with these test subjects in particular. So that's why those numbers are slightly different for each person on here. And one of the trends that you can see is basically as the contrast gets lower, your visual system needs a longer amount of time to see the stimulus for. On average, there are like some error going on here. For, so it's not like every individual. There are individual differences. Um, but it would appear for the most part that as you get to lower contrast where it's harder to see the motion anyway, your visual system is going to take longer to just kind of take in information before it's going to be able to decide to uh, a reasonable degree. Yes, I know what the correct direction of motion is and how this thing is moving. Um, so yeah, hopefully that all makes sense. I hope you enjoyed my probation story. Let me get out of here so I can come back and talk to you. Um, so I think I have decided on doing a bi-weekly cadence, so posting a video every two weeks. I know this one came out on the third week and not the second week. Um, I think there will probably be times to time, time to time that I miss a week. I, I do want to like pick a schedule and stick to it. So if it's not going to be Thursdays and it ends up being something else, I will let you know as soon as I know. But yeah, otherwise, thanks for sticking around for story time and my rambling and updates on my work. I'm going to cut to how it's her saying goodbye to you. And until next time, happy physicsing. And I don't know, stay curious. All right, how it's her. You going to say bye to the kiddos? See you in two weeks. Happy physicsing. <laughs>